Um, we've got uh, Josh Grossman joining us. Hi, Josh. Hi there. How's it going? You're going to uh, see us out of this evening, this afternoon's uh, uh, <laughs> this afternoon's entertainment. Um, so Josh is the CTO of Bounce Security, and um, today's talk is going to be about tuning your security toolbox, right, Josh? Yeah, that's it, exactly. Yeah. Do you, would you like to share your uh, share your screen, and I will get you. Uh... Yeah. One second. Um, okay, that's in the right place. So I just need to come down here. And there you go. Okay, can you see that now? I can. We'll add those in. So the floor is yours. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thanks very much for putting on this uh, great conference and uh, some really uh, interesting talks on the on the lineup. So uh, yeah, so I think a good day. Um, so yeah, I've come to uh, today to talk about uh, tuning your toolbox for velocity and value. Um, the idea being, how can you get better value out of application security scanning tools? Uh, I've got quite a lot to go through, so I'll just quickly uh, try and whiz through a couple of uh, words about me. Uh, I can convince my clicker to work. So as you said, I am the CTO of Bounce Security. Uh, we specialize in providing application security consulting for various clients, both lo locally and abroad. I also do various different speaking engagements. I also do training on application security, um, both about uh, uh, the ASPS, which is, a, I guess, a pet project of mine, something I'm involved with at OWASP, um, and also about application security tools as well, um, sort of a a what larger version of this talk so um certainly if that's something that's interesting to you please feel free to get in touch with me um but yeah in my spare time i put a few pictures up of uh, what i get up to but uh for the most part it's uh, application security is bounce and with oasp and uh, some hiking and family time when i'm not working so why, why are we here why do i want to what why do i want to talk about this today so with application security scanning tools, people see a lot of challenges, a lot of issues. Um, it's often difficult to understand what exactly the tools are trying to achieve. It can take quite a long time to really get to grips with these processes and to figure out, okay, how am I going to get value from these tools? How, am, you know, what am I seeing here? Um, they can often provide lots and lots and lots and lots of findings we have to go through and try and triage and say, okay, is this important? Is that important? How am I going to go through these hundreds and thousands of, of records? Um, and often. You know, documentation can be a little bit sparse, certainly for you know, how do I deal with this? Or, okay, I've now got everything running. There's a, you know, I've got a very complex CI CD that puts everything in the pipeline and runs all the scans, but now what? You know, how, how, do I, how do I deal with the output? And the aim today is to try and, I guess, talk through some ideas to help with that. Um, quick disclaimer, uh, your mileage may vary. Uh, every organization is slightly different. Every organization works slightly differently. Not every idea might work for every organization. But uh, I certainly hope that, that some of the ideas I talk about today will be useful for you. Um, before I get started on the ideas themselves, quick revision on some of the key application security scanning tools. So SCA, Software Composition Analysis, I guess the key aspect here is it's looking at the libraries that your product is using. It's looking at the, uh, you know, the third party code that you're using and telling you about known vulnerabilities in those libraries. You know, you have a issue in this version, you need to upgrade to that version. Um, this is something that's happening in, in library code, in third-party code. So it's not code that you've written, it's code that you've brought in from somewhere else. And you're scanning that at, at coding time, you know, whilst you're actually writing. You don't need to be, have an application running in order to do this. SAST, Static Application Security Testing, that is scanning our code. That is scanning the code that we've written to look for vulnerabilities, look for issues. Uh, this is also happening at coding time. This is something that usually you can do but without the application running, possibly even without the application com compiling. You just scan the code and find issues, find vulnerabilities in the code that you've written. So DAST, Dynamic Application uh, Security Testing, it sounds similar, but it's more from, it's more from outside. It's more um, simulating a real user trying to find vulnerabilities in the application. So you need the application to be running. You need the, the DAST needs to be able to Work with the application you know, via HTTP as if it's uh, you know as if they're a real user to try and find vulnerabilities, um, and that's an automated process. What there's also, which isn't really a testing tool, but it comes up a lot, a lot in this context, is penetration testing, which is looking for also at runtime while the code is running, the application needs to to run 
looking for application, looking for vulnerabilities, but we're talking about a, a, you know, a real person should be doing this. A real person is sat there manually thinking, okay, how can I break this application? How can I find or prove vulnerability in this application? So first of all, if you want a lot of great information about Dust, I'm not gonna go into too much detail because uh, Tanya uh, did a great talk earlier on specifically about Dust and sort of very similar to uh, some of the other things I'm talking about here for SCA and SAS. So um, certainly check out that talk if you're interested. Um, penetration testing, I've spoken about at length before, I'm not gonna speak about now, um, but you can check out a talk that I did previously if that's something that's interesting to you. Most of the uh, upcoming topics here are gonna focus on either SCA or on SAST. Some might be very, very relevant to DAST as well, but that's the most, uh, you know, most of them are focused around that. And you know, there is a lot that could be said here. I could talk for a very long time about this. You know, in my training course, I do talk for a long time about this um, because I think there's a lot of detail to go into and a lot of um, information that you can gather to help you better get to grips with, with these tools. But uh, I've chosen a few key points I want to get through, um, focusing on how does a tool work, as in just sort of understanding well, what's actually going on in this tool, what sort of features um, are going to be useful to me in this tool, how am I using the tool, so how am I configuring it, how can I work with it, so what processes should I have with it, and how am I fixing issues. Some ideas for you know, what can we do to actually deal with the issues that are coming out of these tools. So let's dive into the first section, how does a tool work. So, first of all, difficult matches. This is more of an SCA thing, but I think it's quite fundamental. Now, it may be that you've got a very, very sort of modern application and using a package manager. Your package manager has a manifest that says exactly what libraries are being used, um, you know, which libraries have been brought in, which versions of those libraries. And, and you know, that's fantastic. If, you, if you've got that, that's great. And a tool like a software composition analysis tool will certainly look at that and uh, use that to to tell you what issues you might have in your libraries or vulnerabilities you might have in your libraries. But what if you don't have that? What if you're dealing with some sort of older legacy application? Maybe the package manager only covers part of it. Maybe you know, it doesn't have a package manager at all. Maybe it's a lot older and it's built up over a period of time. You know, I've seen applications where they have built a very, very large monolithic web application. They've pulled in JavaScript libraries from here, from there, from everywhere else. They've you know, stuck them all over the place within the application. One person liked to store JavaScript in this folder, one person liked to store JavaScript in this folder. And if you're just looking at Package Manager, that's obviously not gonna be enough. You wanna make sure that your tool can look in other places as well. You know, what is it gonna do if there's no package manifest? Um, some tools will look for a particular location on disk or you know, a particular folder structure. But what if that folder structure isn't there? What if, you know, what if just a library is there? What if someone has changed the name of the file that the library is in? What if they've changed the checksum? You know, they updated something manually within the file, even if it's just a comment, and suddenly the checksum isn't the same. Maybe the tool is relying on that checksum to identify the library. Uh, what happens if someone has minified a bunch of libraries, they've bunged them all together into one file, and suddenly it's not you know, four libraries in four files, it's four libraries in one file. So it's important to understand whether you know, that is a situation for you, whether, whether that is something you're seeing, and whether your tool can handle that, because if it can't, it's going to become a lot more difficult to be able to identify what libraries you're actually using and you run the risk of, of false negatives. So this is a widely applicable issue. You know, what do I actually need to do to get a scan? What do I need to do to be able to scan my application? So some scanners will work on, uncompiled, on uncompilable code. You know, any code fragment, you can scan the code fragment and find what you need. Some scanners might require the code to compile. They might want to compile it themselves in order to get more information about the code or how the code works. If that's the case, that's fine, that's okay. But then you do need to be able to, you know, you can't start this too early. You have to, you can only start scanning once you've got some sort of compilable object. There are some scanners where you might want, it might actually want binaries. It might want your code to compile to binaries yeah, and maybe they need to be done in a special way. Maybe it's not the same way as you'd usually package them for your own testing or for your own uh, CI/CD. It maybe they need to be packaged in a particular way. That's something to bear in mind. That's something you want to keep an eye on because it will very much affect how you perform the scanning and where you perform the scanning. You know, if you can't perform the scanning until you've got fully compilable code and you know, most of the code already there, that might slow things down. Um, compared to be able to run it, you know, in the browser on uncompiling in the IDE on uncompilable code. Alternatively, 
if you need to compile it in a certain way, but you're hoping to put it in line in your CI CD, that might not work. It might be you have to have a branch off your CI CD that compiles the code in the particular way that the scanner needs, which yeah, that's fine. It's not a big deal, but you need to be prepared for that. You need to be ready to, for how you, you know, to configure your CI CD accordingly. So we talk a lot about the top of composition analysis. Okay, you'll discover this vulnerability in this library. You'll discover you know, this issue. You can go through the reports. You can figure out what's going on. But what happens when you know, there's a very urgent, very immediate issue that you need to deal with? You know, Log4j is a, the overused and classic example. You know, I was seeing information about that on Twitter on a Friday morning, and I was already messaging teams. But you know, if you're going to be waiting for your, your scanner's database to update, and then to run a scan, and then to get the report, and then to look through the results. That's not going to be fast enough. You need a way of being able to deal with these more urgent issues as well. You know, this sort of third-party library risk, you, know, you certainly want a tool to manage it on an overall basis. But how are you getting that up-to-date information? How are you going to get, get that, OK, you need to deal with this right now? Uh, maybe you have a th threat intelligence provider who can help you with that. Um, maybe your SCA vendor can actually give that to you. Maybe they have that information for you um, for an alternative channel. Um, I'm going to get laughed at if I say Twitter, but it's not a terrible way of finding out what's going on. Twitter is a very good way of finding out what's going on in the security world, uh, very uh, up to the minute, or other people's security blogs or you know, other sources of information. What will help, though, is if your SEA tool is preparing some sort of inventory or software bill of materials, then that's going to make it a lot easier to investigate this sort of issue and to discover, you know, am I actually using this library? Where am I using this library? So that's certainly something to bear in mind. So next, I want to talk about the usability and the, the interface. So there's very much an idea that you know, we want to try and bring information from these tools into a developer interface, into something sort of ticketing system that they are used to already, that they're not having to look at a different pane of glass. They're just looking where they usually look. I think that's fine. I think that you should get there. That's certainly the direction you want to go in, but it's not necessarily where you're going to start. And I think you are going to spend time having to look through the interface of this tool to make sure that, you know, first of all, you understand if you, exactly what's going on with a particular finding. You may need to go through this interface in order to get rid of a whole load of initial results that uh, you know, trim down some of the noise. You may need sort of the more advanced features that the user interface might provide. If you're done a SAST scan, and you've uh, got a, a finding relating to some sort of code flow where input comes in here, goes through these 14 functions, and then goes to uh, get exploit uh, an exploitable function further down, you're not going to capture that in a ticket very easily. You probably need, are going to need to go back to the interface to understand that. So you want to make sure that whatever tool you're using, the interface is usable. You, know, you need to be able to work with that and be able to feel comfortable working with it. Um, just relying on on tickets in some other system is probably not going to be enough for every use case. So that's some thoughts about, um, I guess, features of the tool. But so what happens when we come to use this tool? What do we need to think about when we're actually using it? So in any sort of reasonable sized organization, if you try and bring in a tool like this or you're using a tool like this, Someone's going to want to know how are we doing, you know, how are we performing, you know, are we improving, are things getting better, you know, is the smiley, you know, is the smiley face up or is the face you know, pointed down? Um, if you don't, I suppose, decide up front what you want to measure and how you want to decide this, someone, someone's going to start to decide it for you. Someone's going to look at a number, say that's now the number that we rely on, and all our uh, KPIs and all of our uh, business processes and assessments and uh, um, enforcement is going to revolve, revolve around this number. So it's something that's important to think about up front to make sure you know how, how are we going to measure our progress in this. So in terms of how is a tool doing, which is it'll see, it's definitely an important part of this, um, you may want to look at the, the quality of the uh, data that you're getting from the vendor. You know, how good is this tool? How good is the data that we're getting from the vendor? You know, how much information we're getting that we couldn't get somewhere else. You know, if this is an SCA tool, how many vulnerabilities are we seeing that we don't see in NVD or which have additional information that help us make better decisions that we wouldn't see in you know, a publicly available data source? Um, 
how long does it take to actually run these scans? Is this slowing us down? Is this causing everyone big headaches? Um, you know, we don't want to make people sad with this. We don't want to make, especially we don't want to make developers sad. We don't want them to associate the security tool with a bad experience or a slow experience. Uh, we might want to consider how accurate is the tool. How, you know, what's the ratio of uh, false positives that we're seeing to compare to real results? Are we identifying false negatives? You know, a classic example might be if you do a penetration test, for example, somewhere down the line and they find a vulnerability and you're like, well, that's weird. Why didn't the SAS tool find that? Maybe you discover that uh, your SAS tool just didn't pick up on this. It should have seen this in the code, but it didn't. That's an example of a false negative. For SCA tools, that might be missed libraries. Okay, we know we use this library, but we're not seeing it here. Or well, why, why not? Um, and again, we're thinking of ways we can track, you know, how is this tool working for us? Is it doing well for us? If we are seeing that we're not getting the value from it, or we're not getting um, the speed from it, or we're not getting the, uh, the accuracy that we need, that might be an indicator that the tool isn't doing what we needed to do. So the other side of this is how are we doing? You know, are we performing well? Are we managing to progress on the findings that are coming out of this? Now, it's very easy to just look at the very sort of, okay, this is the current number in the tool and this is how we're doing. And if that number goes down, then it's good. If that number goes up, it's bad. It's certainly more complicated than this. I think I'd certainly recommend saying, well, what, what do we expect to happen? What's our, what's our commitment? You know, how fast do we expect to fix things? Or you know, within what, what service level agreement do we expect to fix things? And then bring out numbers that compare performance to that. So they've got some sort of baseline expectation rather than just looking, does number go up, does number go down? Um, I'd strongly suggest splitting out between you know, what are these issues are new issues and what are these issues are fixed issues. You know, it's not just a number change, it's also how many do we fix and how many are new. So we know, okay, well, we, we made progress, but there are there are new vulnerabilities that come up. Maybe the database got updated. Maybe new vulnerabilities came up for a particular package. So you know, we want to capture that information. Otherwise, it could be quite demoralizing if we just see a number going up without capturing the fact, well, actually, we did a lot of work to fix things this time around. It's worth tracking how how we fix these issues. You know, if we're doing a proper remediation or an upgrade, which I guess would be the uh, you know, the best option for SAST and for SCA, where we actively fix it in the way that the tool expects, and, and that's great. If we're if we're having to use some sort of other mitigation, um, some other method of making this better, that's not the exact way we're supposed to, then we probably want to track that. And just you know, if we're always using mitigations and we're not using you know the the best possible way, the best remediation, and we're not doing the upgrades, then yeah, it might, it might indicate that we're struggling a little bit with our process and that we want to uh, you know, rethink how we're actually addressing these. I'd strongly suggest also picking out you know, not just numbers of issues, but also what types of issues are we seeing? You know, are we seeing issues that recur over, over and over again? Can we use this information to drive our training? Do we want to push our developers to uh, you know, spend some time learning about these particular areas? If we do training and we see these areas are still returning, maybe there's another issue. Maybe the training isn't good enough. Maybe we, um, you know, training hasn't given them the information they needed. So certainly we want to use this to, you know, improving our numbers here aren't, isn't just about fixing things. It's also about stopping them from happening in the first place. And uh, we can use measuring our performance to help with that. So there are lots of different parts to this process. You know, who's going to actually implement it in the first place? Who's going to install the tool and set everything up and, uh, Get, get everything running. Who's going who's gonna to make sure the scans happen? Who's going to build those into the pipelines? Uh, who's going to fix the issues? Who's going to deal with the issues when they when they come up with the findings? Um, and who's going to review the results and prioritize and decide, okay, this is the order in which we're going to fix. This is where we're going to start. So in a lot of organizations, I think the risk is that the answer to all those four sections is, well, we'll get the security person to do it. Um, this is a security tool, so it's a security job. It's a job for the security person. It's important to just share the love a little bit here. <laughs> you know, everyone has a role to play here, and by by expecting the security person to do all of these, then I think we're pushing them outside of what they're actually good at and what they're you know what we should expect from them. And I guess taking time away from them doing other more practical tasks that are suited to to what they want to be doing, what those security people need to be doing to maintain the security of the product. You know, in terms of implementing, you know, maybe it needs to be someone who's familiar with the tool, familiar with the overall processes. Um, but also, you know, maybe a more technical IT style. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's very much sort of a practical element there. 
It may be that for particular policies, particular configuration, they want to consult with security, but it's not necessarily a security function. Similarly, for running and, and maintaining the scan. So that's very much a DevOps job in terms of, OK, we need to put this into this pipeline. We need to uh, set this to run after this. We need to get the results pulled over to here and you know, integrated into that. Again, this isn't you know, exactly how that happens or you know, the specific configuration or the overall plan. Again, can consult with security, but the actual hands-on who's going to do that, that's a DevOps thing. Um, in terms of reviewing and prioritizing results, this is probably where you want the most time from your security person to be spent because this is where their knowledge really comes in in useful to understand, okay, here's where we need to start. Here's what we need to do first. Here's where we need to start. You know, here's what's most risky to us. Because then when we get to fixing the issues, you know, that's ideally someone who's really familiar with the code, the developer, the architect, someone who's you know, down in the weeds of how all this code works or and, and can understand, okay, well, this is what I need to do to make this work better. This fix will work. This fix won't work. And again, everyone here can consult with a security person. But we don't want to um, expect that the security person is going to do all of this because it's going to put a significant burden on them. And again, they don't necessarily have the bandwidth for it. I think it's also important to include everyone so that everyone feels they have some sort of involvement and buy-in because you know, ultimately this is starting to be benefit everyone. It's not just to benefit the security person. And speaking of buy-in, none of this is going to happen from the bottom up. If you have security people sort of running around developers trying to get them to start using this without any sort of management expectation, that's actually what's going to happen. It's not going to happen. You know, there's a <laughs> You know, another trope that security is everyone's job. Well, everyone's job is what their job is. You know, the job is defined by their manager, and the manager's manager defines what the manager's job is. You know, we very much take the cue from up top. If management aren't pushing this, if this isn't clearly a priority for group leaders, for VPs of R&D, CTO, however it works out, then you know, it's, it's not going to get done. And I don't think this should be an expectation it's going to get done. You know, ultimately, they're the ones who define the priority. It's certainly not up to security to, to chase around and try and make this sort of thing work. Um, it's another thing that's just going to create a, a, a negative view of security where security is seen as you know, the police chasing around trying to um, enforce the, uh, the law, whereas they're not getting any backup, they're not getting any input from the actual management of the people who are, need to be doing this. And that means... We need to make a way of measuring it. We need to make sure we understand, is it happening? Is it not happening? Are we on target? Can we provide management with information showing that so that they can then take action if necessary? And you know, what's the process for saying, look, we can't do this right now. We can't deal with this issue, but we will deal with it then. And you know, providing some sort of explanation about, OK, we can't do this now, but we are going to do it next week, next month, next sprint, however it needs to work out. But it needs to be a clear process that you know, this is Whoever needs to do this understands that it's their responsibility to do it. They have buy-in from their boss. They can ask their boss to prioritize for them if necessary. But you know, it's something that's coming from their organization. It's not just coming from security causing everyone a headache. The final point here, you know, I mentioned how early can we do this. You know, if we can do this already in the IDE whilst the developer is writing the code, then that's fantastic. You know, if we can, once we've written code, compiled code, sent it up to CICD, packaged it, scanned it, got a report, sent the report back to the developer. You know, who knows what the developer's thinking about next? You know, maybe they've moved on to the next feature. Maybe they're just not thinking about it anymore. Depends how long it takes to come back. We can give them immediate feedback in the ID that says, look, there, you've just tried to use this function. You've just tried to use this library. There is a problem. You might want to you know, look into this. Then they're already in that context, they're already in that mindset, and you know, they're much more likely to be able to fix it there and then. You're going to need to tune that. You don't want to have too many sort of false alarms. If you know they're constantly getting security pop-ups flashed up at them, like this one that I made up, then you know they're not going to want to deal with it. They're going to say, you yeah, know, continue, 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 continue. Let me get on with it. None of this is ever helpful anyway. It needs to be targeted. It needs to be well tuned, but it can certainly catch a lot of things in the bud. Probably can't catch everything, and there shouldn't be an expectation that. If everything's clean in the IDE, then it will go to the report, you know, the, the full scan, and it'll be clean as well. But it can certainly catch some of the, uh, the low-hanging fruit. So that brings us on to, you know, the more specifics about oh, how, how are we actually fixing these issues? What do we, can you know, how can we actually do this in a more efficient way? 
So the first thing I say is you do not want to switch everything on at once. Do not suddenly, you know, search for absolutely everything. Do not suddenly uh, raise alarms on every single vulnerability in every single library. Do not suddenly scan for every single possible code quality issue and I don't know, brackets on the wrong line issue from your from your SaaS tool. You need to take a phased approach. Um, these tools will put out a lot of results if you let them and you know, suddenly seeing, okay, I've now got these thousand things to look through or hundred things to look through is, yeah, so that's, a, that's a big, it's gonna cause a very, very bad impression of the tool. It's gonna cause bad, bad feeling from the tool. Um, you need a plan for how we can do this gradually. Let's start off with the most important things. Let's start off with what we're really worried about. Okay, we'll fix those, we'll get those dealt with and let's move on to the next ones. Each time, you know, more findings will trickle through and that's fine. Um, as long as it's on a more graduated basis, I think it's going to be easier to have that. How do you know which findings get your best signal to noise? So, you know, which ones are you getting the best results? Which ones are you constantly not going through and saying, okay, false positive, false positive, false positive, you know, choose some that you know are real and need to be dealt with and you see from the initial results, you know, these generally come up with real issues. Um, which findings are highest risk? Maybe that's based on the tool. Maybe that's based on the application. Um, you, know, you need to try and find that balance, but again, you need to find a way of phasing that in. So I may take a lot of grief over this, but I would certainly recommend trying to upgrade early and upgrade often. Um, if you can upgrade even before waiting for a vulnerability to be in your libraries, then that's even better. Let's say, look, we want to keep these libraries up to date so that if there is a vulnerability, we maybe we've already gone past the vulnerable version, or maybe it's very easy for us to upgrade. We certainly don't want to get stuck in a situation where we're three major versions behind and suddenly a massive vulnerability comes up and we're suddenly under pressure. You know, that can be a lot, a lot more difficult. It can be even more difficult if this is a product that we're actually deploying to someone and now we have to support maybe three years worth of this back as well. You know, this is a whole debate, this is a whole, whole sort of discussion in itself, but you really must try and upgrade wherever possible if you want to avoid ending up in these situations where you've got a lot of work to do in a short period of time in some sort of security emergency. It's also a lot easier than actually trying to analyze these vulnerabilities in depth. You know, if you have to say, okay, we can't upgrade this now, so we now need to do some sort of risk assessment and understand um, you know, what's our real risk from this library, there's a lot to go in there. There's a lot to uh, try and understand there. And it's gonna, yeah, trying to do that on a wide, on a grand scale is gonna be hard work. In terms of where do we start, do we want to start on easy to fix issues? Do we want to uh, start on the harder to fix issues? You know, easy fixes give us better numbers, maybe easier, but the harder the fix issues, you know, maybe they're the more, you know, they have higher impact, we potentially achieve something more significant. And we don't want to wait and wait and wait and suddenly have to do this in a hurry. Um, I would say do both. Try and blend in a particular period of time, do some easy, but also keep moving on the hard ones as well. Um, you don't want to just choose one of those. You need to keep those numbers moving. You need to keep you know, getting through the easy ones. But you do need to start and make progress on the hard ones as well so they don't get left to the end and suddenly you know, you're in a massive rush to fix them with some new vulnerability comes out. Think about how to remediate things strategically. We don't just want to fix one line of code in one place and then next time the finding comes up, we'll do it again. Let's think how we can do this at a wider basis. You know, a classic example of this is trying to centralize some functionality. I had a client where they had 150 different issues about log injection in their SaaS tool because every time they did logging, they got a vulnerability about this and they thought they cheated. They thought, okay, well, we'll put all our logging into one function and we'll create a wrapper function and then you know, the scan doesn't know about its wrapper function, just knows about the logging function. So we've changed 150 vulnerabilities into one vulnerability in one place. And I said, that's great. That's exactly what you're supposed to do. Because now you can do your sanitization for log injection in one place and just always use that fun that uh, wrapper function. And then you know that it's going to the wrapper function, it's being sanitized, and you don't need to worry about it. You know, any way you can do that is gonna make it easier to centralize and manage your controls. Alternatively, if you can say, well, look, we've got a, some functionality that works in a less secure way, maybe we can just swap that out for newer functionality that works more securely. Um, it may be a lot of work, but it may be that 
overall, it makes it a lot easier to secure the application and a lot easier to uh, avoid shooting yourself in the foot with something. You know, a classic example could be instead of dealing with secrets locally, have some sort of dedicated secrets management service that handles that for you, handle the encryption operations, key management. Suddenly, you've taken a lot of things that you could potentially get wrong and move them somewhere else. But how do we make sure that happens in the future as well? You need a safety net. You need something that's going to make sure that you know, the wrapper functions are being used, the external functionality is being used. And if someone tries to use the original function or tries to use the unintended functionality, then it's popping up alerts saying, you might want to check this out. They're not using what we expect them to be using. Yeah, this is uh, you know, the idea here is to make these things easier. You know, wrapper functions, externalizing the functionality to a dedicated service. You know, we've, come, we've centralized our security risk. We've centralized the controls easier to manage, but we just need to make sure that's being used on an ongoing basis. So that was quite a fast tour. I hope all those issues were useful. I um, hope those ideas are useful. Like I say, not everyone might be relevant for every single person, but uh, yeah, I hope that uh, you can use these ideas to try and improve the processes and just make it easier for yourselves and make it easier for developers and you only get a better, exp better experience from these tools. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much for listening. And uh, let me know if you have any questions. Thanks, Josh. That was great. Oh, we have got a couple of questions for you, in fact. So, uh, firstly, from Juan was, if you only have budget and time to do one thing, what would it be? Um, company away day in the Seychelles? No. Uh, um, so, as in one, you know, one, one type of tool. I guess that's what the meaning is. Yeah. Like you do SCA or SAS or whatever. SCA or SAS. <laughs> I think there are different risks here. I think that you know you can go all in on a particular tool, and you can spend a lot of money with a vendor, and you can. Um, you, know, you can spend, you can get something very sophisticated and start building very sophisticated processes. But you know, I, I think that if you go all in on one, then you know, there are other possible risks you're not covering. Um, I don't think it's, I don't think it's an easy sort of trade-off saying you should do this and then you should do that. You know, I think you you're exposed to risks either way. You know, if you're if you're that limited on time and budget, maybe you need to start off with something simple for both and sort of progress gradually. Um, I think that just saying we're going to do this and not do that, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that's a, a decision you can necessarily make. You know, certainly for um, you know, for all of these tools, there are freeware versions that might not be super pretty for developers, but um, will give you some sort of position you know, without starting pay, paying license fee. I think the important thing is to have some sort of perspective and some sort of control around all of these, even if it's relatively rudimentary. I think you're going to struggle to say, no, I will start here, and then you know, we'll just ignore this area completely. Yeah, um, yeah it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky one, but I think you can't necessarily just rule out particular issues or a you know, particular type of uh, issue because you know, it, it can all, all of it can cause you risk. And then one last question from... Uh... I think we're both clicking the button at the same time, Jamie. <laughs> Mark Johnson, if security isn't a priority, I assume it means in your organization, what advice would you give to approach management to get more support on security? Um, I think you know, we have to try and demonstrate what is our risk here, what is our exposure, you know, what, what, what could go wrong? Um, you know, this... You know, this isn't necessarily a, this isn't you know, this isn't a threat modeling talk, but a lot a lot of it comes down to you know, maybe even sitting people down and saying, "All right, what could happen here that would make us you know really sad? You know, what could ha happen that would completely ruin our day? You know, and it, you know, maybe on a scale of you know what would give us a bad day, what would give us a bad week, what would cause us like significant monetary harm, what would end the company? You know, every organization has risks that." affect it and that are going to you know is going to have to consider odds are if they have some reliance on software then you know software security risk is, is going to fit in there somewhere and i think that hopefully by demonstrating the link between what is going to make us really sad what is going to end this company 
and bring that link back down to, well, you know, what are our practices? They how, how could that happen based on our current practices, or you know, how could that happen um, without doing X, Y, and Z? Then, you know, hopefully, it that becomes an easier conversation because you're directly linking it to you know, what are management worried about from the business perspective. Um, and look, maybe you have to start small. You have to prioritize. You have to say, well, we're just going to focus on this particular application, which has um, you know, which management are particularly concerned about, or is going to focus on this particular type of issue. Um, but I think the key thing is to link, you know, what is going to make management have a bad day and what's going to make that company have a bad day and linking that back to what you're trying to achieve. Yeah, great, great answer. Thank you for that, Josh. It was a, a great talk, super interesting. And thank you for joining no us. No problem at all. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, thanks for the really interesting conference. Right, so I'm going to drop you out now. Uh, oh, uh, we've got Andy Martin just come back for the to come back to get all the plaudits at the end. Right? <laughs> okay. Congratulations, excellent uh, job, everybody. This is uh, it's pretty much the end of the road. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I'm uh, I'm ready for a lie down. I think in a dark. <laughs> but before we go, um, so some thank yous. Um, thank you once again to all of our fantastic sponsors, Sneak Sysdig, Contrast Security, Codefresh, MuleSoft, Stackhawk, Bright, Psycode, and Blue Bracket, um, without whom this conference could not go ahead. Um, thank you uh, to my fantastic co-hosts, um, Jamie Thomas, Andy Martin from Control Plane. And uh, I'll see you in, uh, in Austin next week, Andy. I look forward to it immensely. Excellent. It's hot, apparently, over <laughs> So uh, I'd bring you shorts if I was you. Um, so uh, thank you to everybody who's watched uh, this EMEA section of uh, DevSecCon 24. Um, the Americas section uh, hosted by my very good friends, Eric Smalling and Brian Clark, will be starting in uh, just less than one hour. So if you do have time, I'd highly recommend um, coming back to see us or hanging around and, until then, I had a quick look through the uh, through the schedule this morning. Looks like there's a whole bunch of really great talks. Um, again, particularly uh, in my space, in the Kubernetes space, uh, Lewis Den and Parry talking about threat modeling Kubernetes. I'm not quite sure how he's ended up in the America's time zone. Obviously, uh, Cardiff has, uh, has changed since I was there last. Um, but uh, that'll be great. Uh, there was also some stuff about CI fuzzing, which I'm, I'm also super interested in, a whole bunch of other fantastic talks. Um, thank you to all of our speakers today. Again, um, without people putting their hands up and writing talks and coming to talk at these things, obviously, conferences would be fairly boring, as we wouldn't be sat here for four hours talking nonsense to each other. Um, so I think uh, that is is about it. Um, so uh, at this point, uh, yeah, thank you, uh, folks, for for watching us, and uh, hope you hang around uh, for the rest of the conference. And now I've just got to click this button. I think. Mm -hmm.